Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7's Israel Ator update. And as we continue to deliberate the various developments, both here in Israel, throughout the region and beyond, it is always important to highlight that 168 days ago, the Islamist terror groups in the hamas played Gaza Strip launched an onslaught on southern Israel, declaring war by perpetrating a massacre, murdering some 1,200 mostly civilians, wounding over 4,800 others, and kidnapping 246 people, including elderly, men, women, children, and infants. 134 of them remain in Hamas captivity to date. Let's now turn to our TV7 editor at large, Mr. Amir Owen. Amir, let's initially focus on the Gaza Strip. What can you update us with on the latest? Well, you are right, Jonathan. Um, the war uh, started um, in the Gaza Strip, as you said, on October the 7th. The next day, October the 8th, Hezbollah joined. Then, nine days after Hezbollah, October the 17th, the Houthis started uh, their attacks on uh, shipping and uh, later other uh, proxies of Iran, other uh, Shiite militias and other groups uh, joined uh, the fray. And uh, as we are speaking right now, in the sixth uh, month of the war, the main front is still Gaza. And within Gaza, even though there is fighting in the southern um, city of Khan Yunis, the entire urban uh, area, right now the focus is back in the north around the Shifa hospital, where apparently hundreds of uh, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad personnel um, came back uh, believing that Israel is now neglecting the areas which uh, it has uh, vacated after going south, but they were surprised by uh, the um, accuracy of Israeli intelligence and uh, a lightning strike by naval commandos and other forces, armor and infantry, and hundreds of them were either captured or killed with a lot of intelligence uh, being now exploited, um, leading to other arrests or uh, uh, firefights. However, the major story today comes from the diplomatic front, where uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken um, is in Israel following his visits to uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, where he talked with the uh, de facto ruler Mohammed bin Salman and then President Sisi, as well as their foreign ministers who are less important, of course. And in Israel, uh, Blinken met with Prime Minister Netanyahu and later with the entire World Cabinet. And as we are uh, awaiting the uh, readout from um, Blinken's uh, travels here, we know that um, on the eve of his uh, Israel stop during his tour, he said that depths are getting narrower in the uh, negotiations regarding the hostage deal and the uh, ceasefire uh, proposal, including uh, the efforts to get more humanitarian aid into uh, Gaza. Um, he said that as far as he knows, the Israeli delegation uh, in Doha, headed by uh, Mossad director uh, David Barnea, has full authority to uh, make progress uh, in the talks. But as he was saying that, the American draft resolution in the Security Council uh, calling for uh, ceasefire, along with the release of all the hostages, was vetoed by Russia and China. Now, apparently, these two powers do not have um, a lot of disagreements with the uh, language of the uh, resolution, but they don't want uh, the United States uh, to get credit uh, for it. So these diplomatic uh, efforts or maneuvers will go on. Indeed. Well, a couple of things, I think, also during his uh, visit in Cairo, he held, of course, also a meeting with a foreign ministerial of a number of Arab states, including Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and surprisingly, to a certain degree, the Palestinian Authority, during the course of uh, which they discussed also not only 
the current state of play in the Gaza Strip and on a regional aspect of things, but also for the day after the war. And the fact of the matter is the, the Palestinian Authority being present in the room uh, sends also a clear signal to Jerusalem about uh, Washington's expectation that they would be the ones who would take over in the day after something that is, of course, a point of contention between Washington and Jerusalem at this stage, uh, absent any reform uh, other than exchanging one Palestinian Authority prime minister with another. Uh, so uh, we're waiting to see what will emerge out of this. Another point that, of course, you highlighted is the veto by Russia and China. Uh, since it's not about the merit or the essence of the maneuver by the United States. Uh, it's about the fact that it is the United States, and we're in an age of strategic power competition, which gives us a little bit of perspective maybe, and hopefully also in Washington, that this is not only about Gaza, it is about a much broader issue, namely the Islamic Republic of Iran and the various fronts. This is a multi-sector war. It's not just one war in Gaza. It is high intensity in the Gaza Strip, low intensity in Lebanon, low intensity in uh, Iraq, for that matter, even though the last 46 days were quite uh, quiet in both Iraq and Syria, but low intensity also in the Red Sea, where maritime shipping has been uh, uh, abrupted by the Iranian proxy, Ansar Allah, dominated by the Houthi tribe, targeting maritime shipping over 30, uh, excuse me, 75 times, which uh, speaks volumes also to Iran's blatant operations. But I'd like to turn to the commander of the Israeli Air Force Task Force for Air and Missile Defense, namely Brigadier General and Reserve, Dawan Gavish. Good to see you, General. I'd like to hear your perspective on the latest developments. We just heard also following the meeting between Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken that uh, Netanyahu basically appreciates or told the, the American top diplomat that he deeply appreciates the support that the United States granted Israel following the October 7th atrocities committed by Hamas, but whether or not the United States will support Israel in the engagement to eradicate the Islamist Hamas in the border town of Rafah, Israel will do so with or without its support. Well, indeed, Jonathan, you know, it, it goes back to the tensions uh, that we basically talked about them um, uh, from the first weeks of uh, this war. We used to talk about the tension uh, between the two main goals of uh, this war, which is from one end, uh, the fight against the Hamas and uh, what Israel is expected uh, out of it, and also the, um, the release of the hostages and, and the tension that there is between this and uh, there would be a day that uh, this I would say go would be a bit more uh, on the front and some other, the, the other goal would be in the front. I think this is the, also the same thing with the United States. We The best, the, the interests are, are aligned overall, but there are some points that uh, there is a tension uh, between uh, those uh, interests. And at the end of the day, uh, we have to look around. We have to consider, uh, of course, for sure, the, the the, the U.S. Uh, point of view, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, if this is something something that Israel sees that it is essential uh, to gain the goals of uh, this war, so uh, this is what is expected, I think, from uh, our leaders is to stand uh, on our, uh, you know, on, on our interest. Uh, we cannot uh, allow ourselves, I think, to stop uh, this war. And uh, at least at, the, at least at this point, so I, I think that this is it is the point of uh, tension. Uh, but then I also think that there is a way uh, to overcome it because uh, the question is not uh, only if we go there is how do we fight over there. And I think on this there is still a place uh, for agreements uh, between Israel and the United States. Uh, we all know that there is a, an incredible. Uh, support that uh, Israel uh, got from the United States uh, all along uh, this war, for sure, uh, on the military uh, part of it, which uh, we are close to it, and, and we see the, the amazing, uh, no, not other word, uh, support that uh, uh, we get uh, from the United States. The other point that I wanted to make, and, and this is uh, referring to what you've said uh, very rightly before, uh, Jonathan, I think that, you know, if we are looking on the 
uh, countries around us, there is a gap between what we uh, hear, uh, let's say, from the crowds and, uh, and the interest uh, of the countries themselves. And, and this is something that, uh, the, you know, you could uh, sometimes speak uh, about it uh, behind closed doors. And, and, I, and I believe that this is uh, what at the end of the day is happening because we see that uh, from the strategic point of view, I think one of the success from the Israeli point of view is that we still keep the relations that we had with the Arab uh, countries around us. And uh, this is something which is uh, super uh, important. My last point would be with regard to the, uh, to the Ramadan. This was uh, again, something that uh, the Hamas uh, was looking for, which is to ignite uh, the, the, all the area during the Hamas, during the, sorry, the Ramadan. And we see we are already the second year, second week into the, this time. And uh, relatively uh, things are uh, under control. And this is super important uh, from, uh, from Israel point of view. Let me highlight the latter. I think in the last, 10 years, I don't remember such a quiet Ramadan in the West Bank districts of Judea, Samaria, right. the Jordan Valley, uh, something that speaks volumes to the deterrence that has been accomplished uh, during the course of fighting in the Gaza Strip. On the one hand, it's a double-edged sword, of course, but while uh, the uh, excessive efforts by countries like Qatar, Iran, Russia, China, and others to flow the web uh, and other media outlets and other methods with disinformation, it also is a double-edged sword that it also causes additional deterrence within the Arab street. And by doing so, of course, it, it will trigger some uh, pushback on all kinds of calls by terrorist organizations to try and challenge uh, the qualitative edge that Israel has in uh, the spheres of strong power. But uh, let's now turn to uh, a former Air Force commander and uh, the chief of uh, uh, cyber staff of the IDF, namely Brigadier General in Reserve, Yaron Rosen. It's good to see you again, General. I'd like to immediately also engage uh, you on another angle to this war. Uh, yesterday, we saw the committee in the United States Congress uh, of the Middle East, on the Middle East and North Africa or Africa at large. And uh, during the course of which we heard uh, General Kurila, uh, the commander of Central Command, uh, speaking about many of the intricacies throughout the Middle East, the challenges that are posed to uh, the US and its allies and partners, including Israel, and he highlighted, of course, the fact that uh, China is the recipient of roughly 90% of all oil exports by the Islamic Republic of Iran, which in turn funds the Iranian activities, both throughout the region, but also its transfers of sophisticated weaponry, drones, and others to Russia for its war in Ukraine. And we're seeing an increased understanding, at least from a practitioner's level and also a military level, that this is uh, genuinely part of a strategic power competition, including the war in Gaza. Nevertheless, it seems like governments, not only the United States, but also in Europe and elsewhere, are lagging behind and are not somehow managing to align policy with the challenges at hand. Jonathan, that's very true. I think, um, you know, the superpowers are playing here, you know, a multi-level campaign. Um, there are so many levels to what's going on now in Gaza. Gaza is only where the region explodes right now. We've seen it explode in other parts of the region. Um, you know, uh, what's going on in Yemen is, is almost a decade old already. And it comes out wherever and whenever um, the superpowers, um, you know, each side neglects something and then you see how uh, Syria explodes all over and, and sends millions of refugees to Europe. This whole thing starts from the highest level between the West, namely the US and, um, and Russia. Russia having a very strong and very important stronghold uh, in the Middle East in Syria. And then that 
uh, coupled with uh, the, the Russian-Iranian pact that is getting stronger and stronger, along with the interests of the Turkish uh, government uh, getting more and more on the eastern side of the alliances, all this is pressing down and pushing uh, various elements um, against each other in the region. That's how the re this region works, sadly, for the last century. Uh, since the Sykes-Picot, uh, Sykes uh, Sykes uh, nothing has really, really changed since then. And uh, namely, the people of the region are paying the price. That's how uh, cynical um, this region uh, has been, uh, th this, this is how cynical the situation is, and sadly, we all, all of us are, are are paying the price for it. Um, right now, uh, Hamas and Iran, uh, what we're seeing with the umbrella uh, of the various uh, higher level forces that I just uh, mentioned, Hamas and Iran, with the help with the help of the Russians and maybe even more than that, are waging a, an asymmetrical strategic communications campaign on top of everything uh, physical, kinetic that is going on in the region. So Israel now, I think, is uh, really experiencing a very, very strong uh, campaign again in the, you know, in the international arena, forming a picture of, uh, you know, hum hum uh, humanitarian crisis in Gaza, which which is not true. Um, but you know, it doesn't matter what really happens. It it what matters is what people think uh, ha uh, that happens, and and that is a huge challenge uh, for Israel and for the and, and for the continuation of the war effort. Uh, with that, because of everything that is going on so loudly on the strategic uh, on the um, strategic arena and uh, in Gaza we're seeing that the north of Israel and the south of Lebanon are virtually held captive by Hezbollah. There are hundreds of thousands of people, both in Lebanon and in Israel, that are outside of their homes uh, f more than five months. This is unheard of. For a country like Israel, 15% of its population is outside of their homes. This is something which is just uh, strategically a huge, huge uh, problem for Israel, uh, such a small country. So right now, Israel is losing its uh, initiative. There's no real uh, alternative narrative to a different solution in Gaza and, and for the north. And Israel needs to pressure uh, uh, to leverage the discussions to strike a broader deal for all of its borders, including Gaza, includes, including uh, Judea and Samaria, including Lebanon. Um, and I think with, uh, without an alternative solution, what we're going to hear, sadly, is again and again, two-state solution, a Palestinian state, which is a wrong and terrible solution in the near term. What we should say is no to a Palestinian state or a two-state solution, and yes to a regional mandate, at least for the next 25 or 40 years. I don't see anything alternative to what uh, I just mentioned. Uh, and I think that is a different story that we need to start talking about with the U.S. administration uh, in the near future. Indeed. Well, I, I think a couple of uh, elements that are quite interesting, and that is that many of the senior practitioners and officers in Europe have started to change their opinion about a two-state solution, uh, looking at uh, the situation in a clear-eyed manner, uh, because they do realize that uh, you can of course, maintain some sort of wishful thinking, but wishful thinking without concrete actions in the field are not viable. And with uh, neither side really keen on, on seeing such a reality uh, manifest, uh, naturally something like this cannot uh, take hold. Uh, and another point uh, that you mentioned, the important uh, presence uh, from a Russian perspective to its uh, uh, foothold in Syria, uh, General Kenneth McKenzie, uh, who 
was the former Central Command uh, commander, spoke about Russia quite often, and particularly the fact that it maintains its base there in Taltus, particularly where it uh, uh, holds its naval port alongside its uh, air force port in Latakia, uh, is for the sake of shipping towards Africa. It is its hotbed, so to speak, in the Mediterranean Sea. And he was cautioning back then lawmakers uh, in the United States about the fact that the Russians are very eager to enter into Africa, something that today we see, even in Niger, but we see it elsewhere as well. Uh, the Russians are outmaneuvering the United States and other Western forces. We see uh, even France lowering its investments in uh, Africa from over 40 billion to just a couple billion uh, this year or the past uh, year. And the, the situation is becoming grimmer and grimmer from a Western perspective at a time when China, Russia, Iran and their allies and, and proxies throughout not just the Middle East but beyond around the world are trying to play uh, within their own game at a time when democracy tries to compete within all kinds of constraints that are supposed to constrain, of course, governments from employing challenges on their own subjects, but uh, it uh, is not an even playing field, to say the least. Mr. Owen, mm -hmm. the Northern Front, where are we with it? Well, uh, before we get to the Northern Front, I see that you're holding a vote on the two-state solution. So please count me in the uh, Biden Blinken uh, camp. Um, we always I, do. I don't want us to hold a vote because I'm afraid I'll be in the minority. But uh, nevertheless, uh, um, let us be clear that not everyone on this show has uh, uh, the uh, same impression. Also, when you talk about democracies, the uh, nation of Israel is undergoing a severe crisis regarding uh, its uh, democratic uh, form of government, but this is uh, for another day. As for the uh, uh, Northern Front, and um, I see that uh, General Rosen um, is uh, somewhat nostalgic for the uh, pre-World War I uh, Ottoman Empire era uh, before Sykes-Picot, but, uh, but General, at that time, there were uh, no air forces. You wouldn't have... Uh, a job there um, flying uh, in combat. So uh, maybe it's better that we are in the present and looking uh, towards the future. We see that Hezbollah, uh, which is the de facto uh, government of Lebanon, of course, masquerading uh, behind the uh, legitimate organs of the state, which are powerless. Hezbollah, either because of its own self-interest or uh, per uh, directive from Tehran, does not want to expand uh, the war beyond the blows exchanged across uh, the border. And uh, actually, this can go on uh, for a long time uh, without uh, too many casualties, uh, at least in Israel, except for what you all said regarding uh, the people who were displaced, uh, dislocated, and therefore, once there is a ceasefire in Gaza, not only uh, should and probably would there be a ceasefire uh, along the Lebanese border, but there must be a diplomatic solution, lest a military force will have to be employed. Going nostalgic, right after Sykes-Picot, a couple of years later, 1925 Arab Revolt, a similar situation, a couple of uh, uh, Arab militiamen attacked the French, trying to uproot them from that country. And ultimately, under Sultan Bashar al-Attraj, they managed to uh, kick them out. But nonetheless, for three entire days before leaving, as an act of revenge, the French bombed Damascus from the air, armored and uh, infantry uh, and with artillery. They're talking, uh, at least there are conflicting reports on that, but some say that uh, roughly 10,000 civilians were killed in that attack. And subsequently, also the French government tried to uh, push that aside. F thankfully for them, they didn't have media to confront them back then. But nonetheless, talking about history, not everybody who are so uh, 
sitting on their high pedestals today preaching towards Israel have uh, acted in uh, a fashion that was far worse than what Israel is doing today, which is unprecedented when we're talking about collateral damage. But we have roughly two minutes left, unfortunately. And very briefly, uh, General uh, Gavish, we'll start with you. In less than a minute, what should we focus on for the next 48 hours? Well, I think uh, if we go back to the operational level, it is uh, quite impressive to see what is happening uh, around the Shifa hospital. This is uh, still something that uh, Israel is uh, operating on. And uh, yeah, we, we have to say, and Amir talked about it before, so I won't elaborate, but it is very, very effective, surprising uh, attack. No one was expecting to it. And uh, when I'm talking about effectiveness, it, it's the, the large amount of uh, of terrorists that uh, have been uh, uh, killed over there, uh, another large amount of uh, terrorists that are uh, taking into uh, Israel or t t taking into those areas to be in, uh, integrated and, uh, and a lot of uh, intelligence that it's coming uh, with it. So it is uh, very important. And some of those terrorists are uh, quite high level uh, in the Islamic Jihad and also in the in the Hamas. And uh, this is very important. So Shifa and, of course, uh, Khan Yunus and preparing uh, the idea of preparing himself uh, to Rafah. General Rosen. Two things uh, on the strategic level, I think. Uh, one is Israel needs to... Uh, counter the strategic communication ca uh, communications campaign that uh, Iran and Hamas are waging against Israel uh, regarding the narrative in Gaza, what's going on there and where things uh, should go. It is very important because Israel is losing its uh, support in the West. Uh, we're seeing it from the Netherlands, from uh, the Brits uh, in regards to arms and things that Israel needs for its uh, future defense. Uh, this is a strategic risk that we need to manage. Second, uh, manage. The second thing is uh, uh, a much smarter person than me said that it's craziness to think that if we try something again and again and it doesn't work, uh, to continue uh, trying and hoping for a different result. Um, I think that the narrative of, Palest of a Palestinian state uh, needs to change to a uh, narrative of a regional mandate in the Palestinian territories, whether it's Gaza and Judea and Samaria, in the interim of two or three or four decades, until a new generation of Palestinians can take over. In the meantime, Israel, the US, and regional players, responsible players, such as the UAE, Bahrain, Saudis, Egyptians, uh, should take care of uh, their Palestinian brothers. Uh, it's one school of thought. We'll go with that, and we'll deliberate that more thoroughly for another time. Uh, Mr. Oren, briefly. There is still a lot of support uh, for Israel regarding the what, the eradication of Hamas. It's about the how uh, that uh, the uh, ways uh, are parting for Israel and its supporters. So the challenge for the Israeli leadership is to find innovative ways of achieving the war aims without alienating Israel supporters around the world. Indeed. Uh, two points that I will briefly add to. Uh, one, obviously, Mr. Oren, I always try to maintain as much as possible a spectrum of uh, opinions and thoughts on the program to allow our viewers to understand that uh, Israel is not one thought, but it's uh, multiple vast host of thoughts and therefore uh, in a room of uh, four individuals, even if it's virtual, there's still plenty of thoughts to be heard. Uh, secondly, when we hear uh, yesterday, again, going back to uh, the committee in the U.S. Congress, we heard Dr. Wallander on the one hand calling on Israel to abide by international law and humanitarian law and so on and so forth, but when she was asked okay, do you see Israel breaching that in any way? She said no. So it seems like there is a lot of rhetoric coming out, even amongst uh, the supporters of Israel with regard to the need to uphold, but at the same time, it is directed towards their own voters domestically and supporters, of course, around the world to try and basically 
play their own diplomatic games, they have their own interests at heart, and that is also something that we need to keep uh, in mind and counter that, because, anyways, we'll talk about that more in our next session. I'd like to thank General Rosen, General Gavish, and Mr. Oren, and uh, to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next update from here in Jerusalem. Shalom. My name is uh, Doron Gavish and my background uh, 30 years of uh, serving in the Israeli Air Force. My last job I was the commander of the Israeli Air and Missile Defense uh, during the uh, introduction of the Iron Dome to the Defense of Israel. All of this allows me really to be part of the team here in uh, TV7. It is uh, super important to have uh, such a platform. Uh, we talk about the global situation, we talk about Israel and uh, those uh, different angles uh, which are relevant to the discussion.